Afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invite. Actually, I've been to a number of CCP4 conferences, particularly my past life as a crystallographer. Very much, and I always enjoyed the fact that it wasn't just about crystallography. And often, people used to talk about other techniques as well. And hopefully, I've embodied a bit of that multiple technique sort of analysis in this talk as well. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was the work that we're doing over in Leeds on a time-resolved electron microscopy. So to start with, why time-resolved anything? What, what is the, the rationale behind this? And so I'm going to introduce this with the falling cap problem, which was a, a well-known problem over 100 years ago. And the analysis of this was people didn't quite understand how you could hold a cap by its feet, and when you dropped it, it would land on its feet even though the distance between the cat and the floor was quite low. And so I guess ethics was a little bit different in those days, and so was the, uh, how you get yourself a nature paper. But in 1894, this group solved the uh, problem by doing a time result study. That is to say that they had a cat that they held upside down, they dropped it, and then it landed on its feet. So they knew the start point and the end point of the reaction, if you like. But what they didn't know was all the intermediary steps that occur to allow this to happen. So what they did was using photography at the time, they could do this time lapse experiment whereby they could take a series of photographs of the cat being dropped. And from that, they can start to understand the mechanism of this reaction, if you like. And so what they could understand was that the cat was no longer a rigid body. And that's actually how this works. If you think the cat is a rigid body, then it doesn't work in the physics, but when you think of the dynamics of the cat and the fact that it's flexible, then it can land in this way. And what's really nice about this approach is it gives you some valuable pieces of information. That is by taking a series of photographs, you know the order of the events. And because you know the aperture speed of your camera, you also know the time difference between each of these events occurring. So for example, in EM, we may make a grid, trigger a reaction, adding ATP, for example, and then freeze the grid. It looks like the different conformational states, but we don't know the order of those states, and we don't know the time difference between each of those states. It's hard to get that information from that experiment. And of course, the biggest problem we actually have is that often we may trigger a reaction, but by the time the reaction's finished, the grid still hasn't been made. And so we never get to trap any of these intermediary states. And that's really what we've been trying to do with our time resolved EM, trap some of these intermediary states. So before I show you the setup that we've got, I thought it'd be important as well to sort of mention when we talk about time resolution, what we mean, because I'm conscious when speaking to crystallographers, we're actually a few orders of magnitude away from each other. And there's some sort of fantastic work, some of which is coming up later on in the conference. That I'm really looking forward to hearing about on this fast chemistry and being able to use the XL beam line and things like that to be able to look at femtosecond, picosecond reactions, light triggered reactions and following this in a crystallographic context. And those experiments are absolutely, you know, fantastic and mind blowing. And I, that science is fantastic, but we're not competing in that area. We're very much complementing that area because what we're able to do in, EM is to work very much at the millisecond and hopefully in time, the microsecond time scale. And what that allows us to do is to look at domain motions and to look at mechanical motion of ribosomes, for example, or rotary machines spinning around. And those large domain motions are sometimes quite hard to capture crystallographically, of course, because you're constrained within that crystal lattice. And so we're really working in this sort of field here, this millisecond and I say, hopefully, microsecond time frame. But how do we go about trapping these different intermediary states that we want to study? And so there's three ways in which we may go around doing that. The first is that we will take our sample and put it on a conventional EM grid. We then typically blot the grid to make a very thin layer of solution, which we then plunge in liquid ethane. But on its way to liquid ethane, we can trigger the reaction with light. So we can decage a compound and start the reaction. And then when it hits the ethane, we stop the reaction and quench the reaction. And this is dependent to some extent on having a compound that could be decaged. A second approach is to pre-blot the grid to get a really nice layer of solution again, and then to spray on the substrate. And in this instance, we may spray on ATP, for example trigger the reaction when the ATP hits the grid, and then we stop the reaction when we hit the liquid ethane. 
The problem here, of course, is when we're spraying something small, we don't know that we've got good mixing on the grid. We don't know where the ATP's landed. And so that can be a challenge with this approach. And in the third approach, we can mix the protein with, again, ATP or whatever reactant we want. We can then use a microfluidic device to mix this together and then spray it directly on the grid. So now we've got good mixing, but the problem here is that the droplets have to be just right. If they're too big, the ice is too thick and we can't see anything in the microscope. And if they're too thin, they may pass through the grid or create ice, which is not, not useful. And actually the machine that we've made encompasses all three of these elements, although I'm only going to talk about element C because of time constraints today. This is the cell that we've got over in Leeds. It's very much home built. If you look at the back, you'll be able to see we've got pumps from a fish tank for the humidity machine, and my lunchbox is now protecting all the electrical wires for health and safety. But we've effectively you know, bought these things from eBay, Amazon, wherever else to get this to work. But the main thing to note is that we basically have some syringe pumps here that drive the machine, and it's computer operated. So we have really good control over the volumes that we're putting through, the speeds that we're putting these through the machine. And we also have a humidity control stability. We've now developed things like temperature control as well on some of the more recent devices. And what I want to do now is to focus in on this region here in the, the red box, which I guess is the heart of the, the machine, if you like. And then I can sort of explain how, how this came about. So in terms of what we would do, we have a grid here, which you can see held by some tweezers. And then at the bottom here, we have a microfluidic device into which we have two channels. So we have protein and then whatever the reactant is, or we're mixing two proteins, for example. And then you can see the plume of spray here. And then when we set the machine going, we plunge the grid through this plume of spray. The droplets land on the grid. They're frozen in the liquid ethane, and then we can get the ice, and then we can image that in the microscope. And this is obviously slowed down somewhat. And the, at the moment, we can go from mixing to the ethane in about five milliseconds. So time resolutions of five milliseconds and upwards. And at this point, I'm going to go on a slight tangent because I thought it would actually be quite relevant to put the acknowledgements here because I think this is a good time to sort of show how many different people have gone into this project to make this thing work. And so. First up really is, I get this to, there we go, is Howard White, who I've known for over 15 years now, who is based in the United States, but actually takes many sabbaticals in Leeds. And he's really interested in time resolved methodologies and building these sorts of machines. And when I moved to Leeds in 2004, 2005, I moved away from crystallography and John Trinick convinced me to do electron microscopy and to study Macklemeck and machines. And they were really interested in that aspect of sort of looking at the dynamics of the machines. And of course, at the time, Irene Pearson, who many of you may know, was also in Leeds, and she was really a big advocate of time resolved crystallography. So I was getting lots of conversations about the use of time resolved methodologies. And so I was really keen to push time resolved DM with Howard and John at the time. And we've made some progress, but it was slightly slow. And actually, the resolution revolution, if you like, has made a big impact in electron microscopy. But the other thing that people don't talk about so much is throughput, the ability to screen many more grids than we could do. And that really changed how we could sort of design this machine. And actually a very good European conference organized by Martin Trebin and Diana, and they're very big on the physics and the chemistry. And it was working with those that were able to de design these microfluidic devices. And so this microfluidic device actually comes from the crystallography world and from the XFL beam line, and we've adapted it somewhat to our EM machines. We've stolen what the crystallographers have designed and bolted it onto our EM sort of apparatus, and then working with a postdoc and material chemist for a year. And then more recently, David Klebel, who's been with us for about three years now, a very, very talented PhD student. And the final piece of the puzzle was actually Frank Sobock, who's a mass spectrometrist. And so we've brought together the mass spectrometry, electro spray, delivery of solutions, the physics from Martin, the chemistry from Diana, the knowledge from everyone else, Arwin, the, the engineering from Dimitrios to build this machine. And so it's been a, an effort of lots of people, lots of discussions, and not just one person trying to push this forwards. And that's how we've been able to crack many of the problems. And the biggest problem has been making the spray suitable. And so what do these grids look like? They don't look as pretty as you'd expect. If you, if you do your EM, they're not great, but they're suitable for what we need. 
and we can do plenty of apiferritin grids, get around 3.5 angstroms. The record at the moment is three angstroms, actually, uh, resolution on a, a virus sample. But we're not here to make beautiful EM grids. We're here to trap different intermediates. If you want perfect grids, you've got the Victrobot, the Chameleon, the Victrojet, other systems are available to you. And we've worked on a number of different systems. Now, I won't go on about the details, I don't have the time, but we've worked on ribosomes, we've worked on actin, we've worked on liposomes, we've worked on membrane proteins, GFP proteins, chaperones, and they all work in the system. And we're into probably double figures now in terms of the different sorts of complexes we've been putting through our machine and getting data from them. Of course, this isn't a time result study yet, we're just making grids. So to do time resolution, what we really needed to do was to understand the speed at which this machine was working. And again, going to Hamburg with the XFEL people and using their, their kit, being able to do high speed uh, photography and movies, we were able to work out exactly how fast the droplets were going, the distance the droplets were traveling, etc. And we could work out our parameters for the, for the machine. And then we could actually do some time resolve EM. So the, the workhorse for us has been this actomycin S1 complex. So what we have here is a, a filament which is decorated with the S1 complex and then this dissociates off in the presence of ATP. And we know the system really well and in the presence of uh, different ATP concentrations we get different dissociation at 10 milliseconds. So at 10 milliseconds in 800 micromolar ATP we expect 99% dissociation. And when we do the experiments, we, we see just that. So no ATP, full decoration, 800 micromolar ATP, no decoration of the S1 domain, and the grid was made within 10 milliseconds. So there's clearly been mixing at the appropriate time scale. And we can so we can take the actomycin S1 ATP, we can generate various 3D reconstructions of this, which we have done at different time points. And then we've compared the ratio of the full complex to the uh, dissociated complex and compared that with what we'd expect. So the blue line is the expected kinetic result. And then in the gray, you can see what we got from our time result experiments. So what we get is actually quite similar to what you would expect based on the stop flow experiments we've been doing. I don't have too many experiments I can show you because a lot of collaborators want to keep the results close to their chest at the moment until they're close to publication and I understand that but one thing I was very quickly going to highlight was one experiment we've been doing which I guess is sort of topical at the moment and that was monitoring virus capsid changes so viruses in the presence of different pHs so here we're titrating in pH with the virus to cause the virus capsid to expand and we've been looking at the native compared to the expanded capsid at different time points, time one to three of this virus. And so we're using this machine to be able to trap it in different stages of its expansion so we can try and understand the mechanism behind virus expansion through this pH mechanism. So that's another way in which we've been able to use this machine to, to understand more about the science. And the last thing I was going to very quickly touch upon is sort of an added benefit I guess of this machine which we had not anticipated at the start and that was that when you make an EM grid you have a very thin layer of solution you have a large air water interface and it's been known for a while that this air water interface is problematic in terms of the sample and it can cause etc particularly in the lamp scales that you typically make a grid be that you know six seconds something like that and in this study that we recently published, what we're able to show is when you make a grid on the Vitrobot, and in this case, we're looking at the ribosome, you can see, for example, the L31 subunit isn't present in the, full part in, the uh, in the dissociated 50S, but it is there when you go quickly at 13 or 54 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And it's just the same for the S2 subunit as well. It dissociates when you make the grids on the Vitrobot, but not when you make them quickly. And we also see better reconstructions because of a decrease in preferred orientation as well. If you want any more information on that, then uh, most of it's in that paper. We've got a bit more to publish soon, but there does seem to be an effect of time on grid making as well. And with that, I've already done most of the acknowledgements as well. So I just need to acknowledge all the people that have given us money because obviously we can't do anything without the funding as well. And Becky as well, the EM manager has done a lot to help with the EM as well. So with that, I would just like to thank you for your attention.